Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm your host, Bob DeMarco. And as you may notice, if you have eyes, we are now in HD. And uh, as my wife said, HD, huh? You're going to have to start moisturizing. And I see that she's right. Man, uh, I might be an old man uh, reaching middle age, but I can see all the blemishes. In any case, welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. This is your uh, midweek supplemental, number 179. Today, of course, we're going to talk about what's in my pocket. Uh, we'll talk about a couple of new knives coming down the down the pike that are very interesting to me. And then I'm going to take a little first impressions dive into a couple of the knives, three of the knives that I got for Christmas this year. It makes me sound, makes me feel like a child when I talk like that. I got some knives for Christmas this year. Uh, you know, it's supposed to be the kids who feel that way, who are super excited about the gifts and such. But uh, what can I say? I, I am... I am a knife junkie, and when a knife comes, I don't care what it is. Uh, really, honestly, I don't care what it is. Knives as gifts are great things to me, and I've received some that I would never get on my own, even this year. Uh, but to have them and to have someone else think of me and get that for me, I love it. I love it. So forever they stay in the DeMarco collection. So what am I carrying today? Actually, one of them was a gift from a good friend of the show, Dave. Everett, uh, you know him as this old sword. Today I am carrying the Cold Steel Immortal. Let me put it under the knife cam for you. Now, the Cold Steel Immortal, when you look at it, yes, it's quite evocative of a folding pocket um, uh, 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 Gladius, the famous Roman sword that was developed after the, the Falcata, I think it was called, which was basically a long kukri which was uh, adapted from some swords from the Iberian Peninsula, Spain, Portugal, etc. Uh, way, way, way back then. Uh, I guess it was post Bronze Age. They had these big curved. They look like giant kukris, and um, that was all good for hacking and slashing. But uh, uh, when it came time for the Roman army to clean up after the battle, they would have to send pikemen around to to stab all of the dying soldiers, enemy soldiers who had only been hacked and slashed at. And they discovered, wow, we could save a lot of money and not have to employ a bunch of pikemen if we just created a sword that encouraged thrusting because thrusting always ends the fight in a very final way. Slashing, you know, the, the human is more prone to slashing because I think uh, it's been explained to me that intuitively we know it does less harm. And uh, ultimately, we're not looking to do our fellow man harm um, most of the time, especially if we're, uh, you know, just regular farmers who've been in, 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 brought into the army. So anyway, so came the Gladius. And then many, 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 many years later, so came Cold Steel making this beautiful XHP version. Is this XHP? Yeah. XHP version folding Gladius for the suburban dad. I mean, really, who else is this for? Uh, and what is this, really? Uh, but a two-sided Tanto. Look at it. That is a Tanto and a Tanto on top, just without uh, it sharpened up there. So uh, a very cool blade, one that I was really looking to get. And then Dave sent a package uh, of knives. And I, I said that I would foster this one because I've been wanting a, a cold steel for a long time. I gave away all the other knives he sent. But the Immortal... I don't know. It's part of it's part of my genetics. It's part of my family history. So I'm thinking maybe I keep it, especially considering I'm going through a very mild panic buying phase for Cold Steel. But we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, what else is in my pocket today? But a Tony Bowes designed case knife. Now this over here on the knife cam, this is a uh, a back pocket case back pocket. And as you may know, Tony Bowes, the famed um, knife maker who died just recently uh, within the last, uh, in, in December of 2020, um, a legend in the slip joint and custom knife world uh, collaborated with Case on a number of knives. And one of them uh, was this uh, back pocket. And it's got a blade similar to the Lanny's clip, but elongated 
And it's quite a big knife if you look at it for a for a slip joint. It's what is it? That's one, two, three. That's uh, almost three and a half inches, or three and a half inches for the blade. If I push it right up there, and that's pretty big for a slip joint. Uh, they call it the back pocket, I think, because it's that big. And actually, if you put a little, uh, it comes with a leather fob, a little braided leather fob with a case medallion on it, uh, which I took off long since. But with that on there or some other sort of uh, paracord or leather fob on there, it, it actually works very well in the back pocket if you carry your wallet in the back pocket. If you have your wallet there, this uh, the wallet will hold it up right uh, kind of over to the side and you can have a little fob hanging out. And not only will you look cool, but you'll be able to pull that thing out uh, at a moment's notice. Uh, but really, I wanted uh, a back pocket quite a while ago and they were just more... Uh, rare and expensive than I understood when I when I sought them out. And so I found this Carhartt version. This is with G10 for, you know, pretty inexpensive. Uh, someday I'd like to get one in some beautiful jigged bone or something. And it would be fantastic if they made that in their chrome vanadium steel, which I really like. It's basically their 1095. It uh, patinas up beautifully. And it, I think it gets sharper than the true sharp stainless steel, um, which is what that is. Uh, but if you look, uh, one, one more thing about this knife uh, is that it has that working finish that Case does on their Workman series. So basically, you see the, uh, you see the, the grinder lines. They don't polish that out. And that's part of what makes it a worker line knife. So I mentioned, uh, I mentioned a, a little bit about panic buying. And uh, that's a, a term I heard... Um, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Jimmy Slash used because he's been doing some panic buying of cold steel knives. And the reason I bring this up is that, uh, you know, it's kind of constantly in the news right now because uh, if you're a cold steel fan, things are kind of up in the air. And uh, you're hoping, as I am, that beautiful models such as this won't go away in this new CSM thing. Okay. You've heard it a million times. We've talked about, talked about it on this show a million times. But Look at this. I mean, who's going to fill this void? Who's going to fill that void? So we don't know. I have gone out and not gone out. I wish. I wish I had knife stores around here in domesticated uh, Virginia where I am. But uh, I have purchased a couple of cold steel knives uh, that I really thought, uh, well, I would regret not having gotten. And uh, obviously I don't have it here, it has not arrived yet, but it's in this realm of things. And I've gotten the, uh, I bought the dressed up version of the Espada. Now this is the XL Espada. I got the dressed up version of the large Espada, which has a five and a half inch blade. And believe it or not is quite manageable, at least in its uh, G10 version. So I, 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 one of my favorite all-time knife designs of all time is the Spanish Navaja um, fighting knife that was developed, a folding fighting knife that was developed after uh, regular Spaniards were not allowed to carry swords around with them. So they're like, okay, fine, we'll, we'll just make these massive folders and we'll make them beautiful and cool. And they have the ratcheting locks on them. Uh, which actually cold, uh, which uh, Spyderco in their version of the Navaja, which is a very awkward looking design, if you ask me. I mean, it's a nice looking blade, nice enough. It looks like a space age Navaja. Awkward. You know, Spyderco is great at making great knives with really awkward designs. And the Navaja is one of them. But they do put that very interesting notched lock thing in there, which is a um, a tip of the hat to the to the traditional Spanish ratcheting lock system on the Navaja. Anyway, Cold Steel is the only one with cojones out there to actually make a real Navaja in this kind of uh, <laughs> five and a half to seven and a half inch blade size, which is what the real things were. You know, you take away a sword from someone and they make a folder, they're going to make a folder that's like this, you know, so it feels like a sword when it's unfolded. So in my panic buying, I've gotten the dressed up version of that. And you better believe I'm going to be showing it off like mad when I get it. And where will I be showing it off? Well, of course, I'll be showing it off right here on the Knife Junkie podcast. Uh, here, I I'm going to speak while I fold up these awesome, cool big knives. Uh, but also, I'll be showing them on Instagram, uh, it, it on Instagram, and I will be showing it on YouTube. So please be sure to subscribe, 
go check it out. Uh, I'm not the most prolific Instagrammer, but when I do put something up, people stop and listen. It's like Warsaw, Warsaw Insurance from the 80s. None of you remember that. But if you watched 60 Minutes in the 80s, like I had to when I was a kid, uh, you saw those commercials. When Warsaw speaks, people listen. Same thing. Uh, when I put something up on Instagram, it's because it's important. Usually it's an announcement of a podcast or uh, some fantastic new knife that I have to show you. So please go there and check it out. Those are my new knives. But out there in the world, in the wider knife world, there are some other new knives. And I think I want to talk about them right now. You're listening to the Knife Junkie podcast. And now here's the Knife Junkie with the Knife Life News. Okay, so uh, Ken Onion and CRKT, well, you know them. Uh, uh, you know Ken on Onion's designs just for their beautiful, organic um, nature. But in the last, uh, what was it? I guess it was 2016, he slash CRKT announced a new technology in folding knives called the field strip technology. And what that aims to do is create a knife, a folding knife that you can strip down in the field, much like a firearm, without the use of numerous tools like an eight and a, and a six Torx, possibly a 10 and maybe something else if it's an Emerson. So the idea is uh, you, you, you have no tools, you take the thing apart, you clean it out because you're out there in the field and you're getting it in the dirt and the grime and the grit. And you don't want it to, you don't want it to mess up the inner workings of that pivot. And you want it to be smooth and you want to take care of your tools so that they take care of you. So the field strip technology, developed by Ken Onion, says, take that knife apart, no tools. So the original one had a uh, a, a little bit of a, um, what do you call it? Uh, kind of a switching mechanism, like a light switch. You can kind of see it on this new version. Uh, but it was around the pivot. You flip the switch about maybe 15 degrees. And then on the back, there was a little knurled wheel and uh, right on the pommel. And you unscrew that. And those two things makes the top pop off. It's a couple of parts. You can clean it, put it back together, lickety split. I do not have one at the current moment, but uh, CRKT and Ken Onion felt it was necessary to update this field strip technology, which is interesting because I have to be 100% frank. I think it's very cool. I never thought it was necessary to begin with, uh, but they've found it necessary to update it. And hey, why not? If you find this field strip technology necessary on your folding knife, why not make it easier? Why not make it one less step? And that's what they did here. So when you look at this knife, uh, this is the new Ken Onion, and people, people think it looks a lot like a Ken Onion. I just say, I look at it, I see an organic curve or two, and uh, who doesn't design with an organic curve or two? The place where this really looks like a Ken Onion is in the last third of the blade headed towards the tip, if you ask me. But in any case, you see that little switch there right on the scale. Well, that's all you have to do is flip that thing down and that and that uses a, uh, that releases a, a lever on the inside and that unlocks the whole top scale. So there's no need to uh, spin a knurled wheel at the pommel there. Uh, it's just one little flick of a switch. So, I don't know. Is it necessary? No. Is it cool? Cool as hell. This is called the Bonafide. Uh, so you know that it's the real deal. Uh, it's 4.3 ounces, 3.55 inch blade. It comes in a couple of different um, uh, finishes. One of them I really like. It's, uh, it's this OD green um, aluminum uh, with D2. And it kind of has that knurled look that I like so much on... Uh, on um, uh, traditional knives. Uh, of course, it's a, a faux bolster, full, faux knurling. Uh, it, uh, not knurling, I'm sorry. Uh, jigging. It's like jigging. And uh, I, I don't know. I just think it looks great. But the, the real USP of this thing, the interesting, unique selling proposition of this thing is that uh, it's one less step to get this uh, this knife field stripped. I look at that knife and I see the decorations on it. And I see the lack of traction and such. And I think maybe this is not actually the knife that someone would actually need to field strip. Because this doesn't look like the kind of knife you take into a field. That that first design with the, it looks a little bit more gentlemanly. But 
whatever. This is more of a proof of concept. And if you know CRKT and Ken Onion, this field strip technology will be extrapolated out into a bunch of different models uh, where it might make more sense. Uh, what do you think of the field strip technology? Did it need this upgrading? Did it need to exist in the first place? Uh, uh, I'd say yes to the latter, probably no to the former, but it's cool that they did it. Why not? Got to give us something new, you know, got to give us a reason to keep coming back. So there you have it. Uh, next up, a uh, designer that I love, uh, he's from Poland. His name is Kambu. Well, he goes by Kambu. His name is uh, Gregor. And, you know, my, my Polish is not perfect, but it's Gregor Gr Grabarski, I think. And I've been following him on Instagram for quite a long time. And uh, his his designs are kind of uh, in the in the Giger uh, HR Giger kind of tradition. They're kind of biomechanical. Lots of uh, busy designs, but not busy for busyness' sake. Uh, busy for traction and style. You know, uh, gription, if you will. Always interesting blade shapes. Um, and uh, usually his his designs come out through Best Tech. Best Tech makes fantastic knives. And I, I applaud them for taking on such complex designs and maybe not designs that uh, would be seen by most as the most practical, but uh, they're beautiful nonetheless. And uh, if Best Tech is making them, they're excellent knives. So this new one is called the uh, Samurai. It's not spelled uh, traditionally the way Samurai is spelled, but uh, it's evocative of something a Samurai might carry. When you look at this thing, the, what is most interesting to me and, and what grabs me the most is that blade. At first you look at it, it looks almost like a, what was the, th uh, one of the CRKT Williams blades. It looks like a real long um, kind of old school tanto. And then you see right towards the base of the blade, right near the Ricasso, you see, you see an actual hard angle in that curve. Uh, and so that long sweep is broken by an angle and you have before you a tanto with a real extreme long pointy front and a very short flat in the back. So it's a, to me, it's a take on the traditional tanto uh, style. It's actually kind of a take on a blend between the traditional and the Americanized tanto. And uh, this is uh, one of his longest, if not his longest designs made through Best Tech uh, and at 3.8 inches right in my wheelhouse. Though these days I'm I'm a, a simpler man than this, so this I'll leave this for the young bucks to carry around. I'll I'll carry something a little simpler around. But man, I do love that design, and I love that blade shape. And I have to say, I think it would be interesting to see this blade shape adopted on simpler handles, and maybe adopted across a broader spectrum of knives. Um, that uh, long sweeping belly with the short uh, with the short straight at the back. Uh, this one, this particular one is M390. We all love M390 and trust it. And it's on ball bearings and titanium, all, all the usual, all the usual stuff. But look at how, look at how beautiful that knife is. Very interesting design. And I think uh, from my estimation, a lot of very interesting designs coming out of Poland. Uh, you have Ostap Hell, you have Kambu, uh, Gregor Grabarski, and you have many others. And now their names are are eluding me. But I think there's some very interesting designs coming out of Poland. And kind of like when you look at Russia, you can kind of identify it a Russian designed knife, I think. Uh, it's starting to look that way from Polish knives. There's a certain style. There's a certain modernity um, to the handle designs and to the blade designs that just seem Polish. And not for nothing, they have a beautiful language over there, over there in the Poland. Beautiful language. Uh, last knives I want to talk about uh, come to us from Peter Kohler of Dark Timber Knives. Uh, like um, vehement to me, I, I put these guys in, the, in a similar category. They're, they are uh, guys out there who are making really uh, compelling fixed blades in a time where folders really do take all the spotlight, take most of the spotlight. These guys... Uh, and right now we're talking about Peter Kohler of Dark Timber Knives, really take the spotlight for their beautiful and useful fixed blades. But he has a series of four that are coming out uh, right now. And actually, uh, now that I'm saying this, they're pretty much everywhere I've gone, uh, they're, they're hard to find. I'm not sure if they've sold out. I know they went right on sale on the 29th of December. Um, and so I, I have a feeling they've been snatched up. 
but it's a, a spectrum of four knives going from the bushy, which is their 3.8 inch uh, little bushcraft knife where um, uh, uh, Peter Kohler was thinking most bushcraft knives have gotten really thick in the stock and you want a thin blade stock with a, with a nice gradual grind to do the best carving. So this has a, a much thinner blade stock than uh, than usual, but a beautiful, I say beautiful, I sound like our, our current present, but it's got a, 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 a well, beautiful 3.0 inch blade. I love 3.8 inches. It's four inches is the magic spot for a small workable knife, if you ask me. So the bushy is, uh, is there, and then you go one step up from there and you have, which is my favorite in this line, the Comanche, and it's evocative of that 1911 model he came out with a while ago, um, maybe two years ago. And, uh, you know, he's a custom knife maker and, and, uh, uh, has dabbled a little bit in the, in the uh, mid tech realm. And that's, that's kind of what we're looking at here. But in the past, he's, he's had this beautiful short six inch, uh, uh Bowie knife, like the third one down from the top called the 1911. He's coming back with one just like it called the Comanche. And that's very exciting to me because I could I could not get my hands on a 1911, and uh, I the Comanche has a lot of the same characteristics if you look at it. Bowie blade, long clip point, with a nice uh, swale for your thumb, and that beautifully contoured handle. And not for nothing, uh, if you look at the other two blades above it, they have a finger guard, but they're integral to the construction of the blade. They're just part of the ricasso carved out. When you look at the Comanche, it's got the uh, the full uh, finger guard and you know, with the single quillion up there and the uh, the butt cap because this is a through tang unlike all the others here which are full tang blades and uh, Peter Kohler seems to think this is going to be one of the strongest through tangs on the market and I love it I I I love the talk of that because full tang has been the jam for years and years and years if you want the strongest thing out there you get the full tang. But with epoxies today and how people know how to heat treat and with the super steels today, why can't a through tang uh, be be just almost just as strong? Really, for what we're using these things for, um, why couldn't you baton that through a log? Uh, it, that's less than six inches. I say you can, Peter Kohler says you can. Uh, the Comanche will be one of the toughest through tang knives on the market. And then you look at the other two behemoths above it, absolutely beautiful, uh, the cave bear and the devil's horn. And they they sport that that uh, very um, emblematic or typical um, uh, fuller that runs down the length of uh, a lot of Peter Kohler slash Dark Timbers larger knives. And that's kind of a signature I love it. It lightens the uh, it lightens the blade, and of course, it allows a gutter for blood to gush forth once it's jet. I'm just kidding. People call those things blood gutters, as if they're if blood grooves, like they're there to like channel blood when you. That's not what they're for. They're there to lighten the blade. They also make the blade rigid. If you look at it in cross section, it looks kind of like an I beam in a building. So it's not there as a groove for blood. So blood groove is the incorrect term. Just like. Well, I won't get into it. So these uh, are really interesting, compelling, beautiful blades. Of course, I like the Comanche the most. One thing I look at these, I look at the two larger, the Cave Bear and the Devil's Horn. And I have to say, I'm a little bit uh, 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 vexed by the integral guards. They just seem a little sur superfluous uh, to me. I like the way they look a lot, but I'm thinking of these as outdoor knives. Do they even need to be there? Could it be a little peak uh, between the the main choil and the and the handle, and then that uh, extra choil on the blade? It and the only reason I suggest that, and you know, I'm not an outdoorsman, but it seems like in certain outdoors activities, those uh, those kind of extended guards there, integral to the to the blade tank, might get in the way. Tell me what you think. Probably not. I mean, I think they look great. And that's, of course, what matters to me most. But do you think those would get in the way for outdoor chores? Let me know what you think. Probably not. Maybe I can actually talk to Peter Kohler and he can tell me what he thinks. He'd be I think you're a charlatan, Bob. You have no idea. I designed the knife. It works. And I'd say, you're right. I love it. Nice work. So Dark Timber, new line of knives. It's great to see. And uh, uh 
they're a little bit more on the available side, even though at this point they might already be sold out. Uh, but do check them out. Uh, there are probably more coming because these are not coming directly from his custom shop. So uh, presumably they will be ever more available. Dark Timber Knives. I love me some fixed blades and I like people who are doing new and cool and interesting things with fixed blades. So you must excuse me for second guessing the choice of that uh, of that guard there, that integral guard. Tell me what you think. Call the listener line 724-466-4487. I just like saying the number. It makes me feel like a disc jockey. Call us 724-466-4487. Let us know what you think of the dark timber or the new kombu knife uh, from, from Best Tech. Or Can Onion, did they need to redesign the field strip technology? Did they indeed need to come up with it in the first place? Let me know what you think. So that is the listener line one more time at 724-466-4487. Now, let me tell you about some of the knives I have in my state of the collection. And now that we're caught up with Knife Life News, let's hear more of the Knife Junkie podcast. Okay, so some knives that I got from for Christmas, I, I, I've I mentioned them slightly or a little bit in the last podcast, but now that I've gotten them all in, which is, uh, well, four solid, I want to show them all off. And I've had a chance to really uh, uh, noodle around with them, and I want to tell you what I think. First up, a gift from my brother-in-law. This is the Civivi Asticus. I made fun of the name. This came out uh, early 2020, and all I could do was make fun of the name. Uh, a, a bit juvenile, I must admit, but I, I should have, I should have really paid attention because some of our good friends, like Dirk Werning and Alex of Alex's Knife Box, uh, who are really hardcore custom knife uh, collectors, at the beginning of 2020, a year ago, basically, checked this knife out and said, "Whoa." At 60 bucks, this thing is way worth your time and attention. Plus, it comes in a number of uh, iterations. Uh, this one also came in uh, JG10 with beautiful uh, Damasteel blade. And uh, that's the one they were checking out. But uh, this one comes from my brother-in-law, James, Candyman101 on YouTube. Um, and uh, I love this thing. I really love it. Not just for the awesome fidgetability of it, because that that's uh, baked in with a Civivi or a Wii knife, it's gonna, the action is gonna be great. The build is gonna be beyond reproach, you know, like uh, really I've never had an issue with any that have uh, come across my table, but uh, this thing is so thin in blade and so thinly ground in a, in a, in a hollow grind here that this was the post Christmas boxing day box slicer of choice. I had a couple of knives with me. I had the American Blade Works Model 1 version 5, which also performed beautifully, but differently. And I had the Finch Runtley, which I just, I like to say Runtley. What can I say? And, uh, and then I also had a knife we're going to see in a minute that I was a, a, a bit too precious with, so I don't have much of an impression of. But this knife is a cardboard destroyer. So I think that, uh, and that's pretty much all I've used it for so far, and opening up cellophane packages. Uh, but this Civivi Asticus is an incredible, incredible knife and such a great, great value. So if you're interested in, in excellent action and fidgetability and a longish blade, coming in at, uh, what is it, three, uh, 3.75 inches, hollow ground, light, thin, beautiful action. Definitely check out this Asticus. I am always late to the party, and sometimes I blame it on my being the last born, and other times I just know it's my own fault. Uh, it's like when Kurt Cobain killed himself. I'm like, hey, guys, there's this great band called Nirvana. Maybe you should consider checking them out. And everyone else was like, yeah, Bob, we've been listening to them forever. Well, that's what I'm saying about this Civivi Asticus. People have been talking about this knife forever, but now I'm here to tell you, yes, it is fantastic. I love it. And also, it carries really, really nicely with those countersunk screws. I mean, come on, people. Countersink your screws on your pocket clips. It's 2021, man. All right, next up. From my father, a gift. In the last one, I called this the back... 
I called it the back alley, not the back country. But I wanted to go over this a little bit more. I've had a little bit of a chance to use this. I use this on the cardboard as well. And okay, you know, as you might expect, it's got a thicker blade stock than the Asticus. This is not a EDC. This is not a cardboard knife, but it is beautifully hollow ground. And that coating that they put on this D2 is awesome. So if you're going to use a fixed blade for cardboard, this might be the right choice because with that recurve and with the uh, hollow ground blade, it just slips. And, and that awesome uh, coating, which is very smooth, uh, it just slips through cardboard like mad. The only thing is, is it's a little big. And if you're used to cutting cardboard with something smaller, uh, you do have to get used to it uh, with the length of the blade for that kind of chore. Now, uh, I have not used it for any outdoor chores. I have no doubt that it would perform beautifully uh, as like a feather stick maker and other camp chore uh, things. But to me, I look at this and I think weapon. I've mentioned that before, that recurve, that beautiful point, that possibly sharpenable swedge. Uh, I do have to say, though, with this knife, uh, my, my initial con um, suspicions were confirmed in that my medium-sized hands found this handle just a little bit broad. Now, I'm thinking what I might do. So I, I, I'm vacillating. Should I modify this one or should I get another one to modify? And they are uh, inexpensive enough that I might do the latter because... This was a gift from my dad, and um, this is how the knife comes originally. I might want to leave it as is. Now, if I were to um, uh, um, uh, modify this, what would I do? Uh, I would contour these uh, handle scales a little bit this way. Because of the broadness of the handle from here to here, the squareness of the handle here can be uh, a little bit uncomfortable for my for my hands. So I might uh, contour them uh, this way a little bit. And then if I actually decide to get a new one and make changes to the handle shape, I would I would create a more of a finger choil here and and just slenderize this up a little bit. I might even take the back off because and the reason I say all this, is because though this is intended to be a, an outdoor knife, I, I'm, I am prone to sort of turn this into a, an EDC fixed blade that I could stash uh, in the back, uh, in the small of my back, uh, in the waistband like this, in which case I like much shorter handles and, uh, you know, more slender handles. All right, so I'm taking you along on this journey. It's a journey. No, it's a voyage. I'm taking you along on this voyage because I'm not sure if I'm going to do that with this knife. Uh, part of me really wants to leave it pristine because I I uh, appreciate and respect the design. Also, it was a gift. Kind of want to leave it as is, but I also kind of want to put it through its paces as a EDC fixed blade kind of concealed. So I'm on the fence about it. I'll I'll I'll, I'll figure that out, and if you know, I'll let you know what I decide. Uh, not for nothing, but the sheath on this thing. Beautiful sheath. Uh, it, it's cool. They have a little embossed logo there. But something I love about uh, great Kydex is that you can do that. It shoots right off. I mean, that is a good fit. <laughs> so nicely done on the sheath too. And and with a fixed blade knife, the sheath is like the pocket clip. So if you hate the sheath, it's kind of like hating the pocket clip. You know, so nicely done on the sheath there. Okay, the last knife I want to perseverate on is this beautiful thing. I, I, I put up a uh, I put up a quick first impressions of this, but uh, I'm gonna take this over. Look at that thing. Uh, the, so my new HD camera is slightly fish eyed. I'm gonna figure out how to fix that, but it makes the curve on this knife look even more extreme. All right, coming over here to the to the knife cam. This is the. Um, Jason Knight designed Fox Knives Italy produced tactical elements distributed MK Ultra. So if you know what MK Ultra is, it was a mind control, a secret mind control program from the 60s, 50s and 60s, I think, American. 
And uh, also, if you know Jason Knight Designs, uh, this is definitely a Jason Knight design. Jason Knight is a uh, ABS master bladesmith. He was a guest on this show. He was a sort of a uh, substitute forged in fire judge when uh, Jay Nielsen had his wrist surgery. So uh, that's where I first got to know uh, Jason Knight. And I thought, man, this dude's cool because he just has a, a cool presence. He's very chill. And on that show, he'd wear his uh, battle kilt and he had a long beard. And he was just kind of a, a, a chill dude who really, really knew knives. And I started following him on Instagram and discovered that his brand of knives is right up my alley. He's a big kukri guy. He designs and forges incredible kukris that that flex between kukri and bowie. Is, there's like a fluid. So you know how some people are gender fluid? He's like blade fluid between the kukri and the bowie. And to me, that's a, that's a beautiful intersection. Uh, if you're going to be intersectional, uh, I like that intersection. The intersection of bowie and kukri. Look at that. And uh, so for the MK Ultra, they shrank it down and turned it into a folder. Now they also have a small EDC fixed blade version of this. Uh, it's I say small, but it's a little bit larger than this. Uh, I, I'm jumping all over the place, but I, I don't want to forget some details. The first iteration of this knife, which which I missed out on, was a collaboration with Doug Markaida, famed Kali expert, also a judge on Forged in Fire. And uh, I think uh, maybe he helped open the doors to Fox Knives and, and, uh, and because he is not a part of this second collaboration, though I don't see any real changes in the design. So what are we looking at here? This is a, uh, a four, uh, let's see, one, two, three, four. It's a four inch blade. Sometimes it looks a little bit like four and a quarter. I don't know why, uh, it's okay. I'm gonna, it's a four inch blade. Kukri, as you can see, with a with a bit of a harpoon swedge, which which creates a beautiful swale for your thumb there. It's a titanium frame lock. And you have uh, ball bearings in there, uh, ball bearing pivot. So here you go, man. Look at that. Now, a four-inch blade, but I have to say, it carries much smaller. It's, it's svelte. Look, you, you don't have any liners. You have a liner here on this side just for uh, the pivot area on the micarta there. You can see it terminates there at that standoff. So you just have a slab of micarta on this side, slab of titanium on this side. It's pretty slender, uh, just under 0.5 inches. So it carries really lightly and and really easily now let me show this off i'm, I'm going to do a full-on video of this a review video but i'm so excited about this knife i mean uh today as i mentioned i carried the immortal that's the first time i've carried a different knife since i've gotten this thing and uh i do like to rotate i want to compare this to a couple of other kukri-esque knives i have and as you may as you may uh have guessed they're both from cold steel uh first is the the spartan has a very similar blade. You know, you've got that deep recurve. Now on the Spartan, it comes up a little bit more like a clip point and, uh, and puts the point more center line with the handle. So it's, uh, you, you might see this as uh, more of a thruster than this one because of the placement of the point. But I wanted to show these off because they have just about the same blade length there so you get just about well, the, the spartan's a little bit bigger you get about a quarter inch more of the spartan but for effective cutting edge i feel like it's about the same but that's my feeling i don't know how accurate that is but when you hold them in your hand oh my god the spartan is a boat anchor and the mk ultra is an airfoil this thing is uh i i am in no way saying anything bad about the Spartan, I love this knife, but I I don't often reach for it as a as a carry option because it's big, thick, and heavy. This MK Ultra has about the same uh, uh, blade length and uh, cutting edge length and and utility in terms of its blade shape and curve, but it's way more manageable. But this isn't that kind of comparison. I'm just showing off uh, the MK Ultra with a couple of other Kukri esque knives, and of course. 
this is this is the real analog to draw because or the real comparison to draw because this is the uh, this is the Raja two from Cold Steel and this really is an attempt at a kukri, whereas the uh, the Spartan is kind of a copus and and Fal Falcata and different other different influences in there. But this is a tip tip way below the the knuckles uh, kukri, just like this. And uh, obviously, this is way less easy to to carry. But what I love is that both designs carry over this sort of horse horse hoof pommel thing. Um, and, uh, I think, I think the, uh, I think the, the knife cam might be dying on me, but what I want to show, I'll show right here in my new HD cam is that they both have that sort of termination, uh, at the, at the pommel that is very, um, useful when you're choking back and swinging. So a knife like this Spartan or this Raja too. You know, you can hold all over the place. You can come way up here for, as they call it, fine chores or fine cutting tasks. But if you come way back here and use this horse hoof, which is traditionally on a um, on a regular kukri, you get this area. It's not just a bird's beak that holds your pinky, but the whole area widens out and grips the outside of your palm. And you get a lot of swinging utility out of that. Well, this sm relatively small pocketable kukri here has the same design feature at the end of the handle. And that really, really lends itself to being able to swing this thing around. Now, it is it is a four-inch blade, but if you needed to use this for something, you're, this is your only knife and you're out camping, you know, you could swing this in such a way that with that recurve, with this horse hoof pommel here, and with a little bit of percussive action, you could chop through stuff. You've got N690 steel, which is a, a decent and tough uh, stainless steel. And, uh, you know, for those kind of chores, you could make it work. So I do believe that this could be a pretty nice outdoors pocket knife. It's it's relatively large for the, for the weight. It's very, very easy to carry. And I think you're going to get a lot of utility. I'm in this light. I'm seeing some damage I did to it. Not damage, but I, I, I want to get four more of these and keep them pristine. I just love this thing so much. But I do believe uh, that that this would make for an excellent, excellent uh, outdoors knife. I carry it because I think of it as an awesome tactical knife, which it is. It is, and it it pleases that aspect of my imagination. Right now, I don't need a tactical knife. Uh, ever pretty much on me, but just in case I do, this be the thing. I am loving this knife. Uh, Jason, Jason Knight, sir, beautifully designed Fox knives, wonderfully executed tactical elements. Thank you for bringing this to us. I would like to get the fixed bladed version of this. I think with that curve that is natural to the Kukri, I think it's going to carry very nicely on the, in the small of the back the handle up because of that curve it'll be gentle on the on the love handles and uh with that curve you get more handle in a smaller linear space and i appreciate that so i think that about does it for me today and this week uh for new knives uh <laughs> i like i mentioned i do have that large uh cold steel coming in and that will be the espada that will probably round out my collection uh maybe for good. Who knows? Who knows how it goes from here with cold steel? Uh, though hopefully there will always be old new stock. I, I mean, I know that they're, they got bought up so that they could produce more, but I have to believe that not every spear, not every sword, not every one of these exotic things that they create has been snatched up. Though I regret, I regret never getting that mace. <laughs> they came out with a mace. It was like a six lobed uh, German style mace. Uh, that they came out when they came out with the Warhammer. And what a fool. What a fool was I not to pick up that mace, thinking it would always be available. Well, that's your lesson. Uh, strike while the iron is hot. Whew, how's that? All right, y'all. Thank you so much for tuning in to the Knife Junkie uh, Supplemental Podcast, number 179. It's always a pleasure. Uh, I'm going to say have a wonderful, wonderful 2021. You've heard it a couple of times from me, but, you know, I'm going to say it again. Let's uh, let's have a great year and and let's keep our eye on what's coming out. And let me know 
what you're most excited about by calling 724-466-4487. That's the listener line. And uh, we will we will be here. So until next we speak, I want to thank Jim for working his magic behind the switcher. And I want to thank you all for watching. I am Bob the Knife Junkie, uh, DeMarco, and uh, I am out. So don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Thank you.